Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful once again for the Sabbath that's coming and for the fellowship that we can have here this past week. And we look forward to the fellowship of the Sabbath. As we look at the midst of the week for what Christ has done for us, we ask, Lord, that you can help us to have a revelation of Christ, to see how he is speaking to us, how he is guiding us and teaching us and correcting us. We ask that we can yoke up with Christ and learn in the school of Christ his meekness and his lowliness, that we can see that the cross is the center of all things, that it, the death of Christ and his condescension in taking upon himself humanity and feeling our sins, our nature, is the height of Christian experience. We give our hearts to you, Lord, our minds, our bodies, all that we are, and ask that you can use these to your glory in spite of the fact that we are nothing. You created the world out of nothing. We ask that you can recreate us into your image. Be with us now as we open your word together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this study on the midst of the week, um, the final week, the 70, 70th week of Christ from the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, this study that I have here, this was first presented August 6th to 11th in 2018, and then from September 11th to 22nd in the same year. This was prior to Tess Lambert's October 3rd presentations pointing to November 9th, 2019, and to the July 18 studies. So these are the notes that I used for the two camp meeting presentations made on October 17th, 2018. I haven't added anything to the notes except this introduction here, and I've divided it into two parts. This study lays out the literal week from 27 A.D. to 34 A.D., so the literal week of Christ. And I've, I've already done this a little bit in the earlier studies. Revealing the structure of the prophetic mirror created by both 2520s represented in reverse order. So this is the key to this study. This line points to the events of April 2019 when Judas' betrayal occurred. So we're going to look at that. I had no idea what that would mean at the time. As time has passed, we can now see more clearly. Now, part three is new. So I have a third part, and I'm laying out the evidence for April 5th, 2030. So April 5th, 2030 is in the first two parts. Um, but it's, not, it's only hinted at in the original studies. The purpose of this study in the context of our study in the history of the movement from 9-11 to 2023 is to give evidence for April 5th, 2030 date. This date we see is symbolic and gives witness to our lines. We do not yet understand its significance beyond that purpose, if there is any, right? So that is um, the introduction to this study. Now, when we look at the week of Christ, that is, when we look at the 70th week, the 70 weeks, we need to understand how Miller saw these. And we need to understand the development of this truth, especially with Samuel Snow, because most Adventists don't know this, and this, these truths are extremely important um, in the context of this movement, because they bring out symbols that we wouldn't see otherwise. So Miller had this idea. In his writings, he says, <clears throat> um, the Bible chronology says that Ezra started to go up to Jerusalem on the 12th day of the first month, right? That's going to be Ezra 8 verse 31. 457 years before the birth of Christ, 
So he has the birth of Christ where? So he's got 457 B.C. Um, he doesn't really define that, but he has 457 B.C. And I guess you would say, well, if the birth of Christ is in 457 B.C., it would have to be 1 A.D., right? If you, if you take into account that there's no zero year, right? But if you have a zero year, I'm not sure. Do you put it in the year zero? Right? You understand what I'm saying. But he's going to have here the birth of Christ. We'll just put 1 AD. So, so this is going to be 457 years. Now you can see how it, at Miller is not counting in the way that we would count. right? Because we've learned how to count. And Miller hasn't at this point. That is... Going from B.C. to A.D., they're not thinking about it. They're just doing, everything's a cardinal count. And so he's using cardinal numbers. But we know it's the 457th year B.C., not really 457 years from some specific date, right? So that's where the problem is. But So we'll just say 1 A.D. And then he's going to have um, 33 years. <clears throat> being 33 when he died, it died, added to the 457 will make 490 years. So, so we're just going to put here, it's 33 years. And then he's going to put his death. So he's just going to put the cross here at the end of this 33 years. And then he's just going to say, well, this is 490. Right, so 490 years. Now, there's problems with this, of course. Now, he says, the Passover was always kept on the 14th day of the first month forever, and Christ being crucified two days before would make it on the 12th day, 490 years from the time Ezra left the river Ahava to go into Jerusalem. So he's going to take this as the going forth of the commandment is going to be on the 12th day. Here, I'll put it up here. On the 12th day day of the first month, right? And then he says, well, Jesus is crucified on the 12th day of the first month. And so he says it's 490 years to the day. But this doesn't really make any sense, right? Because we know that this is not how the calendars work. And also we know Jesus was crucified on the 14th. Now he uses two verse, verses, uh, that he gives as a reference. He's going to give as a reference at Matthew 26, verse 2, and Mark 14, verse 1. So Matthew 20, 26, 2 says, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. And it says, After two days was the feast of the Passover of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death. Well, this is true. They're seeking this, but that's not going to happen on the 12th. It's not going to happen two days before Passover. So this is unreasonable, and yet it doesn't seem that anybody objected to this. Right? Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples on the Thursday evening prior to his crucifixion. And Matthew 26, verse 2, points to the betrayal as connected to the Passover. Judas had already gone to the priests and scribes. His act of betrayal was yet future. This occurred during the Passover meal. It seems odd that Miller chose this date for the commencement of the 70 weeks. Why did he expect such a precision with the 70 weeks, but not with the 2300 days? So when it comes to the 2300 days, he's not looking for the exact day, right? But he does with the 70 weeks. Whatever the case, we see significance in the fact that the events in 457 BC, Ezra leaving the river Ahava on the 12th day of the first month, and the events... In 31 AD, Judas' betrayal on the same date in 31 AD um, are connected. We believe that Miller's mistake was in God's providence and that there is more light to come. We will address this in more detail later. So the main thing is to keep in mind this 12th day of the first month. And, and this is in the story of Ezra, which we're going to look at in more detail. 
Now, snow, he came to understand that Jesus was crucified in the midst of the week. Now, he did this uh, using this document called the Death Warrant of Jesus Christ. It's a spurious document. I have no idea who created it. There's a possibility that it was created by Mormons. Uh, they liked to create um, biblical documents, right? They were good at that. Um, uh, but it was published in some newspapers. I do a paper on it where I review it and show that its origin is obviously spurious and that it doesn't represent uh, any sort of historical document whatsoever. But um, this is what Samuel Snow used. And the way that I, I dealt with it in 2017 is that basically he was using fake news. And that is, just as today there's fake news, same thing in his day. Actually, the newspapers then were full of all kinds of crazy stories, right? That they were just ways of selling papers. And nobody ever had a way of confirming whether these stories were true, but people believed many of them. And this is just one of those, those things that you would see in a paper and you, you read it and you would believe it. So, so there's a parallel there um, where we have, have looked in 2017 with the fake news, for instance, regarding... Uh, the, Jew, the Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia, and they were having their churches taken away, which is true. And we heard fake news that Seventh-day Adventists, that was happening to them. Um, but the conference president says that doesn't happen because we comply with all the rules of the state of Russia. And so we're not having that problem that the Jehovah's Witnesses are having. But that was fake news, right? Um, and we connect that to the prediction before midnight, but I'm not going to go through all of that. Now, um, the way that Snow allowed it is the way that he looked at it. If we have the midst of the week, Christ's crucifixion in the midst of the week, he could place the 70 weeks, or the end of the 70 weeks in the fall of 34 AD, where Miller had his 70 weeks ending in the spring of 33 AD. Further, it allowed for the spring and fall typology of the 70 weeks and 2300 days, respectively, to be clearly seen. This opened the door to understanding, after their disappointment, the movement of Christ from the holy to the most holy place on October 22, 1844. So Snow starts to introduce these types, which he got from Miller back in 1843. So Miller was saying, Jesus is going to come in the fall, and he starts looking at the fall types. And that passed. But Samuel Snow is, is reading Miller. And he says, Miller is correct. But when Jesus didn't come back in the fall, what that led Snow to do is to study. And he, he started studying this chronology. And he says, I think Miller just has the wrong year. That it's not going to be in 1843. It's going to be in 1844 in the fall. And so his initial paper on February 16th, 1844... Uh, that's going to be published on February 22nd, 1844, in The Midnight Cry. That paper is uh, going to give the arguments that Jesus is going to come back in the fall. So in the spring of 1844, Samuel Snow doesn't... He's not expecting Christ in the spring, right, in 1844. He's looking for the fall types already, even back... Um, uh, he started studying this prior to the end of the Jewish year, 1843. Now, so, so Miller has it. If you look on the 1843 chart, it doesn't give the year uh, for the crucifixion of Christ. Right? It just has, you know, that he's going to be crucified. And if you try to line this up here, you'll see there's a cross up on this side, and this cross is, is placed... You know, it could be 31, it could be 33. You just couldn't tell. It's just, there's nothing to mark exactly where it is. It looks like about placed about a third of the way in a 100-year span that they have there, which is about an inch. So an inch for 100 years. Um, so yeah, they don't put the date when Christ is crucified. And so Ellen White can't point out that mistake on the chart. This one has 31 AD, right? So obviously by 1850... They understood it was 31 AD. But in God's providence, 33 wasn't placed on this chart because otherwise God would have to hold two hands over the chart to cover up the mistakes, 
right? But the only mistakes are in the top right-hand corner in the figures, right, in the numbers. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to look at Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 26 to 27. So we're familiar as Seventh-day Adventists with Daniel chapter 9, but we want to focus upon these two verses because they give us some information that is not often commonly understood. We don't usually address it in the way that we're going to address it here. <clears throat> so, you know, after talking about the going forth of the commandment in the seven weeks and the three score and two weeks, we're going to have um, in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Right? So he's going to die for us. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So what he's going to do here, Daniel is, is he's going to, or a, a, Angel Gabriel, is he's going to give this prophecy of the 70 weeks. And as we all know, we got the 70th week and we got the 49 years here. So that's the seven weeks, three score in two weeks. So we know that. But it's over here that we're going to have this week. So this is the one week. And that's going to be a period of seven years, right? And we know it's 27 AD to 34. And you got 31 in the middle. And it's going to talk here about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, right? So we can say, you know, this is going to be, it's on the 10th day of the 5th month that Jerusalem is destroyed over here. This is going to be the 10th day of the 7th month that Stephen is stoned. This is going to be the 14th day of the 1st month that Jesus is crucified. This is going to be the 10th day of the 7th month that Jesus is baptized, right? And... We also know this is the 10th day of the seventh month. And so should this be. Of course, this we don't have any event here. Right? And this is 457, 408. Right? So we've got all the dates that are given that we, for, for the way marks in this line. So this one week, when we look at it, we know that it's three and a half years, three and a half years. But it's obviously not exactly. So even if I was to look at this from the 10th day of the 10th month to the 10th day of the 10th month, well, that's seven years. But this isn't exactly three and a half. I'd have to go from the 10th day of the 7th month to the 10th day of the 1st month, right? If I wanted to put that midst of the week there. Now, we can say, what happens on the 10th day of the 1st month here? to give some symmetry to this. So Jesus is crucified on the 14th, but what happens on the 10th day of the first month? The 10th day. The yeah, the lamb is selected, right? And that's going to happen at sunset after the, you know, Palm Sunday, right? The, the triumphal entry, right? He's going to come. And he's going to, after sunset, because he's going to see the setting sun shining off the buildings, and then he's going to go into the temple. And so he's going to the temple after sunset, and that's the lamb being selected on the 10th day of the first month, right? So actually the Monday is the 10th day of the first month if the Friday is the 14th day of the first month, right? <clears throat> so that that's what's going to happen. Now, we have this city, so it talks about the Messiah being cut off after three score and two weeks. It talks about the one week, it talks about the midst of the week, and it talks about the destruction of the temple here, 
right? And you know, in the paper, I have this A1, B1, A2, B2 structure. And you know, we can look at the Hebrew there, um, where, when it talks about for the overspreading of abominations, it, he shall make it desolate. Uh, this, this clause is remarkably obscure. Kanaf sikutsim meshonim. And upon the wing of abominations causing amazement. So that's the literal translation. Nobody really knows what it means. It, that's what it is. Now there are other documents that say, and in the temple of the Lord there shall be an abomination. And maybe, maybe it was tradi- uh, um, intentionally distorted by the Jews in some way because uh, after the time of Christ. I don't know. Maybe they distorted that statement for some reason. They thought it might point to Jesus. I, I have no idea. But uh, the, in the temple there shall be abomination is in the Vulgate. The Septuagint says, and upon the temple there shall be the abomination of desolation. And the Arabic, and upon the sanctuary there shall be abomination of ruin. So I think that's probably what it means, not how it's translated in the King James. Uh, the source that the King James had may have been corrupted. Right? And that's Adam Clark's explanation. So we know the temple is destructed, destructed, destroyed. The destruction of the temple is on the 10th day of the fifth month in 586. Now, I've tried to work out exactly what day it is. In our calendar converter, it's going to have August 7th. But when we look at the calendar converter there, it's counting using the biblical calendar. And I'm arguing that the that Josephus is using the Roman calendar, or really the Macedonian calendar. He's not using the Julian, because we know the date, because Josephus is there, and he says it's on the 10th of Ab, right? Um, So he says, so Titus retired into the Tower of Antonia and resolved to storm the temple the next day, early in the morning, with his whole army, and to encamp round about the holy house. But as for that house, God had for certain long ago doomed it to the fire, and now that fatal day was come. According to the revolution of ages, it was the tenth day of the month of Los, which is Av, upon which it was formerly burnt by the king of Babylon. Now, um, that is Jews, when they're going to count um, the time, the months, they're going to go 30, 20, 3029. And so when you get in the fifth month, you are assuming that in our calendar converter, this is cutting out a little bit. I don't know if it's going to affect the recording. But, uh, <clears throat> so if um, so if we if we look at that and we, we try to say, well maybe they're actually looking at the actual month, and that month would be determined. How do they determine the month in the Jewish calendar is that they would look for the first visible crescent. But in the time of Christ, the month is determined by Rome, not by the Jews. And so the question is, were they accepting the month that was, because this is Josephus, is he accepting the month as it's understood by the Romans, not necessarily understood by the biblical calendar? So it is possible. So I prefer to put it on August 6th, right? But, and and that does affect some of the things that we do with these counting of time, but but that's that's how we have it there. So I originally had placed it, I think, on August 6th. I moved it to August 7th, and I moved it back to August 6th. I'm not sure which date specifically, but I do think it's August 6th. Okay, now... Um, this, Ellen White supports this, this account, right? She's going to talk about Josephus. Uh, She says, Titus would willingly have put an end to the fearful scene and thus have spared Jerusalem the full measure of her doom. He was filled with horror as he saw the bodies of the dead lying in heaps in the valleys, like one entranced, He looked from the crest of all of it upon the magnificent temple and gave command that not one stone of it be touched. 
Before attempting to gain possession of this stronghold, he made an earnest appeal to the Jewish leaders not to force him to defile the sacred place with blood. If they would come forth and fight in any other place, no Roman would violate the sanctity of the temple. Josephus himself, in a most eloquent appeal, entreated them to surrender, to save themselves, their city, and their place of worship. But his words were answered with bitter curses. Darts were hurled at him, their last human mediator, as he stood pleading with them. The Jews had rejected the entreaties of the Son of God, and now expostulation and entreaty only made them more determined to resist to the last. In vain were the efforts of Titus to save the temple. One greater than he had declared that not one stone was to be left upon another. The blind obstinacy of the Jewish leaders, the detestable crimes perpetuated within the besieged city, excited the horror and indignation of the Romans, and Titus at last decided to take the temple by storm. He determined, however, that if possible, he should, it should be saved from destruction, but his commands were disregarded. After he had retired to his tent at night, the Jews, sallying from the temple, attacked the soldiers without. In the struggle, a firebrand was flung by a soldier through an opening in the porch, and immediately the cedar-lined chambers about the holy house were in a blaze. Titus rushed to the place, followed by his generals and legionaries, and commanded the soldiers to quench the flames. His words were unheeded. In their fury, the soldiers hurled blazing brands into the chambers adjoining the temple, and then with their swords, they slaughtered in great numbers those who had found shelter there. Blood flowed down the temple steps like water. Thousands upon thousands of Jews perished. And above the sound of battle, voices were heard shouting, Ichabod, the glory is departed. Titus found it impossible to check the rage of the soldiery. He entered with his officers and surveyed the interior of the sacred edifice. The splendor filled them with wonder, and as the flames had not yet penetrated the holy place, he made a last effort to save it, and springing forth, yet again exhorted the soldiers to stay the progress of the con conflagration. The centurion liberales endeavored to force obedience with his staff of office, but even respect for the emperor gave way to the furious animosity against the Jews to the fierce excitement of battle and to the insatiable hope of plunder, the soldiers saw everything around them radiant with gold, which shone dazzlingly in the wild light of the flames. They supposed that incalculable treasures were laid up in the sanctuary. A soldier, unperceived, thrust a lighted torch between the hinges of the door, and the whole building was of flames in an instant. So this last part here is this last paragraph after Ichabod, the glory has departed, is from Milman, uh, History of the Jews, books, Book 16. So, so we have the other ones. Uh, I guess, actually, most of this is from him. Um, but it's in the Great Controversy. So Ellen White is quoting uh, Milman's History of the Jews. Now, if we think about this, this temple, this temple of the Jews being destroyed, we know that this was, as Josephus says, it's on the 10th day of the fifth month, and it's the same date in which the temple was destroyed in 586. So over here in 586, you have the 10th day of the fifth month, and the temple is destroyed. So these dates are connected, and Ezekiel predicts this date, right? Ezekiel is going to predict this date um, in a couple of ways. One is he's going to lie on his left side, and he's going to lie on his left side for 390 days. And when he finishes lying on his left side, it's going to be the 10th day of the fifth month. So I'm just going to show you Ezekiel here. So Ezekiel is going to be over here on July 21st, 592 B.C., and he's going to uh, be told to make a, a model of the city of Jerusalem and to make battering rams and 
And so he's depicting Jerusalem on this, on this wall and, and setting up siege against it. So he's making a little model. It's like kid with toy soldiers, you know, Civil War soldiers, you know, faking a battle. He's doing that type of thing, right? So he's going to set up this model of a siege of Jerusalem. And then he's going to lie on his left side for 390 days. Now he's going to start on July 21st, the fifth day of the fourth month, right, in 592. And for 390 days, he lies on his left side. Now he's going to finish lying on his left side on the 10th day of the fifth month. And that's going to be um, August 14th, uh, 591. And then the next day, so he's got that day, and then the next day, August 15th, he's going to begin lying on his right side. So this is going to be his left. This is going to be his right. And he's going to lie on his right side for 40 days. Right? So he's got 390 and 40. And in both instances... He's going to be facing this siege. Now, he's not lying there for 390 days straight. He's, he's awake during the day. He's going to do stuff during the day. He has to eat and all that. It's just when he sleeps, he's going to be bound by an angel so that he doesn't move from that position. He's going to be facing the siege. And then after he does that for 390 days, he's going to do it on his right side. Now, we know this date, July 21st, is... Midnight, it's Boston, right? It's going to be on July 21st that uh, Samuel Snow is at Boston. And if you think about it, uh, there's, 20, there's 25 days between July 21 and August 15th. This is something we noted in 1844. So this is going to be midnight, and then you have the midnight cry. <clears throat> so this is Exeter. Right, the Exeter camp meeting, the one that most Adventists know about, hardly anybody knows about Boston. But there's going to be 25 days here between this. But this is 390, but 390 is just 365 plus 25, right? So you can see this 390 is going to end on, it's going to, it's going to bring him to August 15th, where he's going to start lying on his right side. But the last day he lies on his left side is the 10th day of the fifth month. This would be the 11th day of the fifth month. So, and then he's going to have a vision. It's going to be his third vision. And that third vision is in Ezekiel 20. So let's turn there. In Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel's just before Daniel. So in Ezekiel 20, <clears throat> he's going to have his third vision. And it says, it came to pass in the seventh year. So he starts his, his prophesying in the fifth year. He's going to have his first vision in the fifth year. So this is two years later. So this is going to be in 590 BC. Right? And remember, this is the fifth day of the fourth month that he... He starts prophesying two years earlier. But it says here, in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. So his third vision's also going to be on the tenth day of the fifth month. That is, this is going to be one year apart. And then the temple in 586, so this is... 586, the temple is going to be destroyed on the 10th day of the fifth month. So you can see in his line on his left side, he's pointing to the siege, but he's also showing this date for the destruction of the temple. And his third vision that's going to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem that goes on for chapters um, 20, 21, 22, and 23, um, those are all going to deal with the destruction of Jerusalem. So the destruction of Jerusalem is prophesied on the 10th day of the fifth month. And then four years later, the temple is going to be destroyed on uh, this date is going to be 
I'm trying to remember what the date is. It's going to be uh, the tenth day of the fifth month, and it's going to be August. I can't remember the date. Anyway, it's going to happen there, somewhere in August. <clears throat> It's going to be on July 18th, on the ninth day of the fourth month, that the wall, walls are, of Jerusalem are bro- broken down. So that's going to be July. So this is like Ju- August 17th, I think it is. I'm just going to put that there, August 17th. Um, 586. So it's the tenth day of the fifth month. Now, so when we deal with Daniel chapter 9, and we have this 70th week, Right? So we have Ezekiel. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And the 70 week prophecy is going to address the destruction of Jerusalem. But it's going to give us this period of probation, right? That's what we understand this. This is 70 weeks. 70 times 7 will I forgive them, right? Not just 7, unto 70 times 7. This 70 weeks, 490 years, is probation. That is, the Jews have this opportunity to be God's people. But when Michael stands up, Stephen sees, so you got Stephen, he's going to see Christ standing at the right hand of God. Not sitting at the right hand of God. He's standing just as Michael stands. So this close of probation here is the close of probation for the Jewish nation as God's denominated people. From then on, they are no longer God's denominated people. But the destruction of Jerusalem does not happen here. It's going to be 36 years later, right? It's 36 years. God is merciful. And and not only that, we know that the Christians are given warning about the destruction of Jerusalem. That's Matthew chapter uh, 25, right? Where it talks about it. Or 24. Is it 24? I always get that mixed up. Matthew 24. It's going to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. It becomes a type of the end of the world, right? So the end of the world is typified by the destruction of Jerusalem. And so Christ mingles language about the end of the world and language about Jerusalem. So he says, when you see armies coming, then you need to leave the city, right? So we know that there's going to be, this is going to be Titus, right? He's the general. He's later going to become the emperor. But in 70 AD, there's Titus. But in 66 AD, uh, three and a half years, that is, This is going to be in connection with the fall types, the fall feasts. So this is in the fall. You're going to have, um, what's the guy's name? Yeah, Cestius. So Cestius is going to come, and he's going to besiege Jerusalem in the autumn. This is not really a good time to start a siege, but he's going to begin this siege in the autumn. And then three and a half years later, We're going to have Titus come in, and he's going to come in at the spring. He's going to come over at the Passover season, and he's going to besiege Jerusalem. And it's that siege that's going to lead to the destruction of the temple four months later, right? So this is a four-month siege. But Jesus says, if you see armies compass Jerusalem, leave. So the Christians leave, right? Because they see these armies, they leave. And pray that your flight not be in the winter or on a Sabbath day. And it's not going to be in the winter or on a Sabbath day when they flee. But so no, no Christians perish in the siege. Except maybe the madman, he might have been a Christian, the prophet who went about wailing for three and a half years, woe upon Jerusalem and you know so forth, that Ellen White talks about in the, um, the Great Controversy. So maybe you know he would be a Christian, I don't know but he's definitely a prophet of some sort. But all the Christians leave. Now, we we take this story here of the destruction of Jerusalem, of the week of Christ, 
And, and what I'm trying to do here is to, to help us understand the significance of this story. Because it's one thing to take these, these dates and put them on a line. But this is not just about some numbers and some math. This is about the cross of Christ. Now, we know if we go to Daniel chapter 9, that this, this prophecy doesn't just come out of nowhere. We know that there was the 70 years Babylonian captivity. There's the four seven times in chapter 9 and chapter 8. There's going to be references back to these. In chapter 9 specifically, we see that Daniel is going to pray and he understood in verse 2 of chapter 9, I understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And we have Jeremiah 29 and Jeremiah 25 and 2 Chronicles 36 uh, that talk about that. Right? They talk about the destruction, the, about the 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And he's going to fulfill those conditions because they come from Leviticus 26. And he knows the conditions that he needs to turn towards God and confess his sins and the sins of his people. And that he does. And so he's understood that there's the 70 years. And that 70 years is based upon 490 years, right? The 70 years is based upon 490 years. Because we know that in 1097, Saul is anointed king, and they cease to practice the sabbatical rest of the land. We've talked about this in the, in the morning studies, right? And then you're going to have uh, this period that's going to lead first to 677. So how many years from 1097 to 677? 420 years, or 70 times 6. Right? And then you're going to have 70 years that go to 607, right? And this is, this is a week, right? Six days, the seventh day. And this is a period of probation, right? They're, they're supposed to have the land rest. If you can have the land rest here, I'm not going to bring your enemies, right? If you hearken and confess your sins, then I won't bring the next 70 times upon, or seven times upon you. But since they don't hearken, there's going to be another 70 years, right? And that's going to be the 70 years, what we call Babylon, right? The Babylonian captivity. They're in Babylon. Okay? So this is an extra 70 years. So this 490 years here, how many Sabbaths, sabbatical rests, are there in 490 years? So there's 70. So since they didn't keep those Sabbaths, they now have to keep the Sabbaths here, right? Okay? And, and Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, he's here at the end of this 70 years of captivity, right? Somewhere here. He's not quite at the very end. He's at the end of the 70 years for Babylon because Babylon has fallen. And it says, you know, after ba he's going to punish Babylon. But he knows there's, there's still more time and he wants to know when that time is. When does the 70 years end? Now, he knows when he was taken captive. And so he's appealing to that, but he still didn't really fully understand these 70 years. And so he's studying it, right? And he says in 9-11, Yea, all Israel have transgressed by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is come upon us, and the oath, the seven times, because an oath you swear seven times, the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the word there, Shabuah, is oath. And so the, the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So the only oath that's written in the law of Moses that would be dealing with this curse is Leviticus 26, the seven times, right? 
So he's appealing to, to these, these, uh, this prophecy. But you can see, God's going to give him a prophecy. And what's the prophecy going to be? It's going to be 70 times 7, right? Right. Because he, well, the 70 years is over. Are we going to, you know, rebuild the temple? Well, yes, you are. Because he tells them, you know, the temple's going to be rebuilt and the streets and the walls, even in troublous times. But, you know, even though you're going to rebuild the temple, because there's going to be these three decrees that are going to happen here. One, two, three, and then the fourth, right? And this is going to start the 70 weeks. Um, and the 70 weeks start, you know, when we look at the 70 weeks as Seventh-day Adventists, we know, one is we don't connect, we don't, care about the first two decrees, right? Even though Ellen White says all three decrees are needed. You can't have a third without a first and second. But the other mistake that we make is we misread the verse, and I understand why, because of how it is in the King James. But it says, um, Know therefore and understand, verse 25 of chapter 9, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, Unto the Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, the wall even in troublous times. And we just kind of put this all into this one line. But actually, in the Hebrew, it says, Know, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, the return of the people, and to build Jerusalem. So what's going to happen is when you get to 457, so you're here in 457 B.C. And we know he's going to leave Babylon on the first day of the first month. That's going to be the going forth of the commandment, right? Now, he still has that period in here, this 12 days. You're going to have the 12th day of the first month. Okay, so, so he's still technically in Babylon. But this is the going forth. But then, when do the people return? That word restore in the King James is the word shuv. Now, it's Old English. So, um, we think of the word restore as like fixing up. But that's not what the word means. Right? It means return. Okay? So, the return, and the Bishop's Bible, which predates the King James, says the return of the people. They add of the people there because they understand that this is about this date, the first day of the fifth month when they arrive at Jerusalem. This is the restore. You know, and we can think of the word like repair. When you repair your room, we can think of that word repair. It's like restore. But if I'm going to repair to my room, what does that mean? I'm, yeah, I'm going to return to it. I'm going to repair to my room. I'm going to go there. I'm going to lie down. Okay, so that's what this word restore is. That's the return Shuv of the people. And then, to, to build, right? So the to build, this is a reference to the administrative structure of the city, the civil authority, because that's what Artaxerxes' decree addresses. He doesn't really address building the temple at all. His second decree deals with the streets and walls, right? Finishing the city and, and the temple. But this one doesn't. But the temple's already been rebuilt back here in 515. It's been dedicated. So the temple's there. He's going to give some materials to beautify the temple. But the to build here is that civil authority which occurs between when he shows it those three days, these three days, right, that 20th day of the ninth month. And it's going to be the 10th day of the seventh month here. That's going to be in the middle. That's the to build. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's, that's going to be part of it. But if you read Artaxerxes' decree, it doesn't say any of that. Right? But he seems to have understood that. Yes, I, I recognize that. So the setting up of the civil authority 
would include all of those other things. Because if they have that power to set up their civil authority, they're going to do that, right? But, and that's why I'm saying that's the to build. The to build isn't just about putting up walls or streets. It's about the structure, right? They have the civil authority to do so. They have the power. They're an independent government. They now can build walls, right? They now can build streets. They can now tax people. They can do all kinds of things that they couldn't do before, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So we know that it's going to be the fourth decree that's going to address when they want to build the walls of Jerusalem, right? Artaxerxes' second decree. Okay. So that's going to be 13 years later because in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. Okay. So if we think about this whole story, that, that the problem that, that um, is here, we know that the, the temple is going to be rebuilt. So Daniel is told that. But he's also told it's going to be destroyed. Now God could have left that information away from, you know, just gave him the good news, but he gave him the bad news also, right? Now, why did he do that? What was, what was, what was the message that he was giving here? What, what's, what's it pointing to? The cross, right? He's going to give this information of the cross because if they just had rebuilt the city, they need, they need a purpose in what they're doing. They had been destroyed. And now God is giving them the gospel. The Messiah is going to be cut off in the midst of the week. Now, what we're going to do uh, tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock is we're going to go through study number two. And we're going to look at the midst of the week. And I'm finishing a little bit he- early here. We're all tired. But we're going to look at that tomorrow. And... Um, I think it's a very powerful story once we start to understand the literal week of Christ. And this was the main thing that was presented in 2018. So can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time that we have had here this evening. And we are thankful for the Sabbath that's coming and the rest that we can enjoy and the fellowship that we have had this week. But most of all, we think about what Christ has done for us. We know that we often do not really appreciate what the cross means and what this message means and how this message is to be given to the world. As Seventh-day Adventists, we are proud self-sufficient, judgmental of those around us. We do things to make ourselves look good. We believe that we're going to be saved even despite the fact that we disregard your commandments. We're of the world. But Lord, you have called us out of the world. And so we want to heed your call. We want to hear this message that touches the heart as well as the intellect. It gives us a reason for our faith. It encourages us to know that you are real, that you love us, and that you have purposed in us the opportunity to reflect your character to the world. So we ask for forgiveness. We ask for your angel's presence for your spirit to be around us, to work in us and through us, that the words that we study and share uh, can be powerful. Forgive us for, your, for our sins. And help us to trust in you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.